Okay, so I changed the title of my talk slightly, but uh, don't worry, it has the same thrilling content. Uh, I'm going to talk about cloud radiative properties, and whoops, that wasn't me, um, and aerosol influences on those radiative properties. Um, specifically, we'll look at uh, cloud albedo and the cloud albedo effect that clouds in polluted environments are expected to have higher albedo, be brighter than clouds in clean environments. And we'll do that by looking at the relation between albedo, cloud fraction, and aerosol optical depth in climate models and in satellite observations. And I'm going to show you some interesting discrepancies between models and observations. We're going to focus on uh, the subtropical marine stratocumulus clouds. Um, I've marked five such regions here on this map. We'll refer to them as uh, Californian, Peruvian, Canarian, Namibian, and Australian. Now these uh, low latitude, low altitude, persistent cloud decks are not only radiatively important, they're also known to be susceptible to aerosol influence. And they're quite often the focus of aerosol cloud interaction studies. So therefore, it's uh, particularly interesting to evaluate models in these regions. So to look at aerosol influence on cloud albedo, first we need a way to look at cloud albedo itself. And I'll illustrate with this cartoon how we do that. Um, if you imagine this here being a dark ocean surface with no clouds, uh, the albedo of that scene will be the clear sky albedo. So zero cloud fraction and uh, clear sky albedo. Now if we add clouds to this scene, we're going to increase the cloud fraction and we'll also increase the albedo. And if all these clouds have exactly the same radiative properties, they're going to fall precisely on a straight line that we can extrapolate to 100% cloud fraction and get a cloud albedo. Uh, so basically, if we have points in an albedo cloud fraction space, we can perform a linear regression and arrive at a cloud albedo. Now, for this to work, uh, we need the cloud properties in, in some spatial and temporal scale to be sufficiently similar. Um, now, they're not going to be exactly the same. There's going to be variations. Some clouds are going to be a little bit brighter. Some clouds are going to be a little bit darker. <coughs> so we'll get a spread around this straight line. And what we're going to do is we're going to make use of that spread, and we're going to see how, if and how, that is related to aerosol loading. So first, uh, we're going to look at the cloud albedo without the aerosols. We'll go to the Peruvian uh, stratocumulus region region off the coast of South America. And I'm showing you here satellite observations from Ceres and MODIS, uh, albedo from Ceres, cloud fraction from MODIS. And these are monthly mean data. And we see how the points from this region actually fall quite nicely on a straight line uh, that we can extrapolate to 100% cloud fraction and get a cloud albedo. And now that satellite observations, uh, when we look in climate models, and this is actually the previous generation IPCC models, the models that were run in support of the AR4, uh, the CMIP3 models. And in that model set, we saw some, some diversity. Uh, some models, like this one, agree quite well with the satellite observations. Uh, whereas other models, like this one, have a quite different view of, of the stratocumulus radiative properties. Now going to the CMIP-5 models, the current generation IPCC models, we actually see an improvement. This kind of behavior is, is not there in those models. So here I'm showing uh, a bunch of CMIP-5 models. I'm showing the estimated cloud albedo for the same Peruvian region again. And uh, the correlation between cloud albedo, uh, between albedo and cloud fraction, sorry, uh, indicating the degree, degree of linearity. And each of these markers is a CMIP-5 model. The black cross is a multi-model mean. And uh, the black markers are satellite observations combined with series and notice from two different platforms, Aqua and Terra. And what we see is that we have, oh sorry, the gray region here indicates where the CMIP-3 models were. So we see that we have uh, higher correlations than the CMIP-3 models. And we see that we have a smaller spread in the estimated cloud albedo and generally a better agreement with the observations in the CMIP-5 models. And we see this in all the regions that we look at, so this is reassuring. And uh, now we're going to stick with the CMIP-5 models. We're going to stick with the Peruvian region. 
and we're going to compare uh, present-day simulations to pre-industrial simulations. So here I'm showing again, whoops, sorry. Here I'm showing again uh, albedo versus cloud fraction. Uh, this is a, a multi-model mean, 20 CMIP5 models. Um, but I'm showing two sets of simulations in the same plot. And the color is an indication of the ratio of pre-industrial to present-day points. Okay, so the redder the color, uh, the more present day points, and the greener the color, the more pre-industrial points. So what we see is a, a quite clear gradient here. So for any cloud fraction, um, the albedo is higher in the present day simulations than in pre-industrial simulations. And we can perform linear regression separately for the two sets of data and actually get a separation in cloud albedo. That's a small separation, but the pattern is clear, and the pattern is clear for all the, the stratocumulus cloud regions that we look at. Uh, so we suggest that this is a manifestation of the cloud albedo effect in the models. So uh, the, the, the aerosol content has increased from pre-industrial to present day, and therefore the cloud albedo in the models has increased. Oh, sorry. So this is something, of course, that we can't uh, test in in observations, we don't have pre-industrial observations to test this. But what we can do is we can see if we can see the same type of pattern uh, on shorter time scales. If we look only at um, present-day climate conditions and we compare clean and polluted cases. So if polluted clouds are consistently brighter than clean clouds, then we should be able to see a pattern in this albedo cloud fraction space if we segregate points by their aerosol loading. So I'm illustrating that with a simple theoretical model that we created. Um, in this model, the cloud droplet number concentration is dependent on the aerosol loading. But uh, the liquid water path does not vary with aerosol loading. So basically, uh, if you increase the, the aerosol content, you get more smaller droplets and you're going to get a higher albedo, which is what the cloud albedo effect says. So when we do that, uh, you clearly see this pattern of cloud brightening. So here's albedo versus cloud fraction. Points are color coded by their aerosol optical depth. So the red, red colors are high aerosol optical depth. The low blue colors are low aerosol optical depth. And we see a clear gradient so that for any given cloud fraction, we have higher albedo uh, where we have higher aerosol optical depth and lower albedo where we have lower aerosol optical depth. So a cloud brightening. And we can separate, uh, do linear regressions separately for a typically clean and a typically polluted case and get a separation in cloud albedo. Now this is a model that we base on realistically varying conditions and it's actually, it, it captures the essence of, of the cloud albedo effect parameterization in a climate model, but it's still a simplification. So we're going to increase the level of sophistication a little bit and we're going to go to satellite observations at GCM output and do the same exercise. Uh, so first, just let me tell you a little bit about the data and how we process it. So we have 10 years of monthly mean data of albedo, cloud fraction, and aerosol optical depth. For satellite observations, we have we combine series and modus, and we can choose between uh, morning and afternoon overpasses from the Aqua Arctera satellites. And uh, for modus, uh, aerosol optical depth information, we only get AOD for uh, cloud-free cases because modus can't retrieve when there are clouds. So compare that to the models, we look at a mean of 20 sigma 5 models that we normalize to the ensemble mean. We can sample the full day, uh, no overpass sampling issues, and we can look at the AOD for both cloudy and clear skies. So those are the differences. But then we treat the data in the same way. We deseasonalize it to take out the mean annual signature from all points. And we also de-regionalize it to take out the mean geographical signature from all points um, to make the data independent of time and relative location within the region. And we look at the AOD anomaly rather than the AOD absolute value. And this is what we see. Uh, we're in the Peruvian region still. And here's our theoretical model for reference, showing the cloud brightening. And in the SIGMA-5 models, uh, this is the multi-model mean then of 20 models. We clearly see that the theoretical pattern comes through, that we have, here's albedo, cloud fraction, uh, and the colors are aerosol optical depth. So, for low aerosol optical depth, blue colors, we have low albedo. And for high aerosol optical depth, red colors, we have high albedo. So uh, we see a cloud brightening with increasing aerosol. But going to the satellite observations, we, we don't see that pattern at all. 
um, we have similar AOD variability. These bars down here show the standard deviation in aerosol optical depth at uh, each cloud fraction bin. Uh, but uh, the aerosol optical depth values are not systematically distributed, so they're not creating this gradient in the albedo cloud fraction space. So we can't see the cloud brightening as we can in the models. Sorry, so uh, is this the case for all the regions? Well, it's the case for the Californian region, the Peruvian region, and the Australian region. But when we go to uh, the Canarian and the Namibian region that I'm showing here, we actually see a reversed gradient. So again, the CMIP-5 models show the cloud brightening clearly, but in the observations, we see a reverse gradient where the high aerosol optical depths are related to low albedos, and the low aerosol optical depths are related to higher albedos. So we think that in these regions, we can have more influence of uh, absorbing aerosol, absorbing aerosol that can be overlying the cloud, darkening the scene. That could partially explain this discrepancy. But still, we have the case that in, in the climate models, for all stratocumulus regions, we see the cloud brightening clearly, but in the observations, we can't see it. Now, I want to emphasize that I don't mean that the cloud albedo effect doesn't exist. Um, what I want to show is that, whereas in the climate models, it actually comes through on a larger scale. Um, in the observations, it seems like it can be hidden or overridden by other processes that are not included in your climate models. So, obvious next step will be identify processes and try to include in models to improve, improve the agreement. <coughs> So let me summarize. Um, I have showed you that regional stratocumulus cloud albedo can be determined from total albedo and cloud fraction. I have shown that agreement with observations improved from CMIP3 to CMIP5 models. We see an increase in cloud albedo in CMIP5 models from pre-industrial to present day that is likely due to aerosol. And we see that the CMIP5 models have higher cloud albedo at higher aerosol loading, but that this effect cannot be seen in the satellite observations. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Right here, at the corner. Um, thank you for this very nice talk. I have a quick question. Um, a lot of climate models have problems in that region to simulate stratocumulus clouds. Did you um, think about isolating the models that do a good cloud simulation and a decent aerosol simulation in that region and just do that study with those models instead of all of the CMIP-5? That's a good question. Uh, we actually, what I showed you was that the CMIP-5 models in general are, are pretty good, at least better than the CMIP-3 models, but for sure we could maybe try to segregate more and look at the better models. But, but the multi-model mean that I showed is, is actually representative for, for all the models. 